I'm going to talk uh, again tonight around vision. I started teaching last Wednesday night on what I called vision and leadership, and I tweaked it a little bit. We didn't get finished last week, but we're going to recap a little bit. But I'm going to talk around vision a little bit tonight. Everybody say vision. Vision. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, um, is it, what version is this, Scott? This is the King James Version. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, um, the, the, he that keepeth the law, when you study that out, it's not so much just like the Ten Commandments, but basically when you receive instruction, everybody say instruction. Mm -hmm. When you receive instruction, you're blessed. That word happy there means blessed. Everybody say blessed. So the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. Um, what's the, uh, what's the uh, New King James Version say? Yeah, where there is no revelation. Everybody say revelation. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no revelation, uh, revelation is when the light all of a sudden is turned on. Does that make sense to you? Um, where the light all of a sudden is the people, uh, where there is no revelation, where there is no light, people cast off restraint. Now, I believe that, um, I believe that the Spanish Bible says where there is no vision, people run like wild horses. Yeah, people run like, how many seen some people run like wild horses? If you come to boot camp, you'll see people run like wild horses. Just kidding. Um, so, so vision, vision is very, very important. And I want to just <coughs> talk to you a little bit about vision. When I look at my own life and my own struggles in this life, struggles not just as being a pastor, but struggles as being a husband, as a father, struggling in uh, just in, in life with uh, electric bills, you know, with me, utility bills, different things like that, sickness, different things. Um, when you're in a fight, when you're in a struggle, if you do not have vision, come on one more time, everybody say vision. If you do not have vision, it's going to, it's going to cost you more. It's, it's going to be harder to walk through it. What godly vision does for your life is it keeps you in the game. When things get tough and things get tight and pressure is applies to, to your life, vision, godly vision for where you're headed. Because see, I can go through stuff. I can go through hell and high water if I can see something coming on the other side. Are you with me? I can stay in the game if I know that there's some hope. I can stay in the game for Kelly if I realize that, Kelly, you know what? Kelly, you're hurting now, but when you get on the other side of this thing, you're going to be better than when you started walking it. Yeah, so that's what vision does, godly vision. Now, there's you can have your own vision or you can have God's vision. Yeah, and to have God's vision, you really have to be totally surrendered to him in order to get God's vision for your life. Because if you're not totally surrendered to him every minute, every second, every day, then your perception and your vision will override yeah, what God is trying to do and what God is speaking to you. It will override that and you'll miss it. Yeah, you'll miss it. So it really, this Christian life is really about empowerment, but it's surrendering to the Holy Spirit every moment, every second of your life. But uh, I preach a message called, called the cause. Everybody say a cause. Uh, sometimes people lose vision, but if you have a cause, you can't let go of a cause. Yeah, I mean, he's lost vision before I have. I've lost vision for it, but the cause kind of keeps you going. Um, so I'm not here so much to talk about the cause, but sometimes you have to fight to keep vision. You have to make yourself uh, stay in the game and fight to keep vision. Now we have God's grace, and God's grace, God's grace basically says, God, I can't, therefore you have to. That's what grace says. Grace is empowering. Come on, say empowering. Grace is empowering. It's a wonderful thing. But sometimes you're going to have to make yourself do what yourself doesn't want to do. And, and, and you've got to stay in the game. And, and, and when all else is uh, blurry and, and, and all else is not clear, you've got to keep that vision in front of you to help you stay because God's making you into something wonderful. Yeah, and it's a process because your life's a journey not a destination. So you need to stay in the process no matter what you face. Can everybody say the process? Touch your neighbor and say, it's going to be all right tonight. Yeah, it's going to be all right tonight. So I began to talk a little bit last week. Why do not leaders or, or people of vision, um, why, why do they, they not develop vision in our lives? And we talked about self-imposed barriers. Uh, and we talked about institutional barriers just briefly, but we talked about self-imposed barriers. Now, a boundary, everybody say boundary. A boundary helps you stay in your lane. 
helps you stay. It's like a guardrail on the expressway. If you, if the guardrail is there to keep you on the road. Yeah, it's there to keep you on the road. A barrier is something that, that, that stops something from coming in. So a boundary keeps you in the lane, but a barrier keeps things out. Yeah, and so you have to ask yourself this question. Do you have boundaries in your life, which you should, or do you have barriers? Now, you should have boundaries, but do you have barriers? What limits you for God's vision in your life? And it's good to kind of talk around these things and understand, uh, do I have a barrier in this part of my life? Because if something is limiting you from becoming everything God has called you to be, you need to look at that something and find out if it's getting in the way of your relationship with Jesus Christ, then it probably needs to be fixed, healed, or moved. And if, if anything takes your focus away from your relationship with Jesus Christ, then that thing that takes your focus away from your relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be removed from your life. And sometimes that's just a process. It's not going to be removed overnight. I told you before, when you get saved, your spirit man is born again instantly. But your soul is a process of being saved. Your emotions, your feelings, your memory, your intellect, that's all a process of being saved. So why don't people develop in vision? Well, I think sometimes we let life talk us out of it. We let life talk us out of it. It might not have anything to do with the devil, anything to do with the prince that's over our, our community, or over our city. It might have anything to do with spiritual, and it has everything to do with us. Sometimes life can just talk you out of it because we're all hurting. We're all broken in some part of our life. We're all afraid of something. Come on, come on. We're all in that dark cave together sometime. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. Thank God for the light of his love and the light of his grace. But, you know, we let life, because we get tired, we let life talk us out of godly vision. Mm -hmm. We let life talk us out of godly vision because we get tired. And the reason why we get t internally tired is because we're not really letting God fight the battle for us. We're doing it under our own strength. And so we've got to keep praying. We've got to keep worshiping. We've got to stay in the presence of God. We've got to have a relationship with his word, not just a church relationship with Jesus. Because there's a lot of us Christians out there that think we got it all together, but as soon as we leave this building, it's back to total dysfunction. And, 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 and you can work through that dysfunction, but your relationship doesn't end with Jesus Christ when you walk out the church doors. It's all good here. We're all good here. But are you good once you leave here? How's your money? How's your marriage? How's your friendships? How's your relationship? How long do you pray to God? How long do you worship? How long, you know, do you, do you put a, a worship music in your car, on your iPod, or whatever you're listening to? What do you do to get yourself in God's presence? Because all, I'm not trying to make you by feel bad. I'm just saying, if we don't get these keys down and start submitting our life to Christ on a, every second daily basis, the enemy is going to have a playground with your mind. And you will not become everything that is. Sometimes you just got to break some old habits. You got to break some old habits because we get in a habit of thinking differently. We get in a habit of dysfunction. We get a habit of fear. We get a habit of this and a habit of that. Sometimes we get in a habit of church. I'm saying that really fast. Sometimes we get in a habit of church. Sometimes we get in a habit of, of just church and our relationship with Christ just becomes a church relationship. But a church relationship with Jesus Christ will not get you anywhere. It might cause you to have a little chill bump or, or, or a little shout of freedom and service and, and to encourage your faith. But if you don't keep that up out there, out there is going to crush you. Amen. So it's, it's a fight. It's a struggle sometimes. But basically, it's making up our mind. Like Paul said, you know what? I'm going to forget those things which are behind. And I'm going to press forward, strain forward to those things which lie ahead. The only way that you can press forward to those things which lie ahead of you is if you see it. Now, you might not see the whole picture. I can't see the whole picture of Kelly Floyd five years from now. Hopefully I'm still skinny and looking good, not, not too many crow's feet, not too much gray. I, I can't see the whole picture, but you know what, Whitney? I can see something because I believe that God has purpose and destiny for my life. And you got to believe that God has purpose and destiny for your life. And I'm telling you, baby, who you are connected with has everything to do with where God is taking you. Amen. Come on, everybody say vision. So sometimes we let life talk us out of vision. And sometimes we just stop believing in a better tomorrow. Listen to me. We stop believing for a better tomorrow. Don't let anything or anybody talk you out of hope. Now, you're going to have those days. You're going to have hopeless moments because you're human. We're going to have hopeless days. We're going to have hopeless minutes, hopeless seconds, hopeless hours, hopeless months, sometimes hopeless years because you, we struggle. 
But don't let it steal from you. Don't let it steal from you the joy of the Lord. I believe that God will fight my battles for me, but I got to let him. I said, I got to let him. And sometimes the Bible says, what do you think the Bible says in all you do stand? Why do you think that's in there? It's because God understands our struggle. And sometimes you're just going to have to stand when you feel like you can't stand no more. <laughs> Sorry, it was really corny. Spirit of Popeye came over me. I'm still trying to figure out what Popeye saw in Olive. She is not a good looking woman. It's anorexic. Her voice gets on my nerves. Oh, it's not her legs. I don't know. It's like Brutus, take her, please. All right, everybody all right tonight? Yeah, so you got you to gotta keep moving forward. So we begin to talk about, uh, we begin to talk about, uh, number one, last week, we talked about uh, what keeps you from being a good leader, basically what keeps you from having good vision in your life. It's when you have no clear, defined personal goals. This will cause a barrier in your life where you have no clear, defined personal goals, where you have no vision, where you have no dream. I said last week that when God gives you vision, come on, everybody say vision. When God gives you vision, it gives you direction. When God gives you vision. Now, I don't know how I'm going to reach that, but I can see that I'm headed somewhere. So when God gives you vision, it, it basically it gives you direction for your life. When God gives you vision, you know who you're supposed to be hooked up with. I, I say this a thousand times. There are no lone rangers in the body of Christ. So there's a lot of people that think they are. They're not connected, but they believe in God. Well, so is the devil. The devil believes in God too. And I'm not knocking on, on, on throwing stones at anybody. I'm just telling you. The Bible says two are better than one. And God connects people. God calls people and connects them to here and to cause a company of people together because they're in covenant and they are walking somewhere together. So who you are connected with has everything to do with where you are headed. And sometimes you got to have a vision and you got to have a dream. But when God gives you that vision and God gives, gives you uh, godly uh, uh, personal relationships with people, it's because of where you are headed. Amen. Vision gives you purpose. Vision gives you purpose. Yeah. I said last week that you will never have order in your personal life until you have a place to go. You will never have order in your personal life until you have vision working in your marriage, till you have vision working in your finances, till you have vision working in your friendships. Come on. Till you have vision working in your ministry. In every part of your life, you got to have vision. One more time for me. Just say vision. Yeah? Vision. I said this last week. Let me give you these stats to you. These are old statistics. So these are probably not, they're probably way out date, but one out of a hundred people in America, 33 of them have no defined goals for their life. 33 of them have no defined goals for their life. The remaining 67 that have a goal, only 10 of them have a strategy to attain that goal. Now I said this last week, I don't want this to sound like a self-help seminar, but there is something that us Christians and we humans don't like to do. It's called responsibility. Some people think because they're saved, God's going to fix everything. God ain't going to fix nothing. God's done all he's going to do. He did it on the cross at Calvary. It is finished. The price is paid. He has empowered me and empowered you to use his word. He's already done it. It's right here. How you talking? That sounded really Kentucky, didn't it? How you talking? How y'all talking? Yeah. What words are you letting come out of your mouth? How are, how is your mind? How are you thinking? What, what thoughts are coming in your mind that take God's done everything. He is waiting. Look, I, I said this before and I've heard this said, so it's not my personal one, but I'm, I'm going to say it again tonight. God turned the tomb of Jesus into a womb. And the first thing that came out of the womb was the head, which is Jesus. And what God is waiting for is waiting for the rest of the body of Christ to come out. He's waiting for the rest of the body. He's waiting for me and you to get a relationship with this thing right here, the word of God, and begin to apply it with grace and mercy to your life. Amen. And God believes in you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. So he wants you to have vision. One more time. Say vision. Yeah. So uh, the remaining 67, only 10 of them have a strategy to attain the goal. Did I finish my thought? I didn't finish my thought. Why am I teaching this way? Because we got to have responsibility. You can have all the chills and the feeling of the presence of God you want, but if you don't have any responsibility, ain't nothing going to change for you. Amen. 
Amen. So you got to apply your life. You know, come on, say, I'm going to apply. Yeah. Two out of every 10 are actually doing something to get to their vision. Two out of every 10 are actually doing something to get their uh, to get to their vision. It's not enough to have vision. You got to have a strategy. I said last week, and this is worth repeating. David, when he was anointed king, was not looking to be anointed king. He wasn't looking for it. He was in the shepherd's field. He wasn't looking for it. Yeah, because if he was looking for it, there would have been self-ambition. And when you, when, when, when you have ambition, it's all about you. What David was in was something called obedience. My gosh, I just got to say some things on my heart. It was in about obedience. His father, natural father, his father said, I need you to tend the sheep, whether he was hiding David or what, whatever. I need you to be here. And that's where David was. Okay, well, what if David wasn't there when they went to look for him? They, Samuel anointed all the rest of the brothers and it wasn't them. No, you're not it. No, you're not it. Do you have anybody else? Well, I have uh, one kid. He's you know a little kid and he's in the shepherd's field. Go get him. What if they went to get him and he wasn't there? Sheep were there, but there was no David. It's because David was standing in a place of obedience. Come on, say obedience. Because he was in the place of obedience, he didn't miss his opportunity. If he disobeyed God, if he disobeyed, not even God, if he disobeyed his father, hear me, if he disobeyed his father, he would have been in a place of disobedience and he would have missed the anointing. Oh, that's a good word right there. He would have missed the anointing because he, was no, he wouldn't have been standing in a place of obedience. What is God telling you to do? Who's your spiritual father? I spent an hour and a half last week on the phone with one of my spiritual fathers, Pastor Charles. Spent an hour and a half with him. Yeah? So I believe in accountability. Accountability for Kelly. How am I thinking? Tell me if I'm wrong. What am I doing? How am I talking? I need to be in a place of obedience because I don't want to miss God's ability in Kelly. And the thing that will mess God's ability up in Kelly is when I step out of obedience. And so I've got to listen to my father. Does that make sense to you? You got to listen to your father. Yeah, that's good. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, Father knows best. Some of the younger ones here, like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. If you put yourself in a position, it will take you to keep you in that position. If you put yourself in a position, it takes you to keep you in that position. I talked about number two what causes you not to have vision and causes barriers in your life? is when you don't understand your strengths and weaknesses. When you don't understand your strengths and weaknesses, yeah? Your strength will always tell you your potential. Your strength will always tell you your potential, okay? Your weakness can define barriers for you, yeah? So we understand that boundaries keep in your lane, but barriers stop things from coming in. We miss it when we venture out of our lane. If I step out of my lane as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, as a man, I miss the things of God. I miss blessings because I've stepped out of my lane. I might be trying to fix everybody, but that's not my lane. And so I can miss some things. Does that make sense to you? So we miss it when we venture out of our lane. And, 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 if, if, and I've got this down here. I'm trying to get my words out. Position doesn't bring value to you. Position. You might have position in the church. You might have position in your company. But that doesn't necessarily mean it brings value or the right value to you. Only God can value, give you the best value. Does that make sense to you? So don't get hung up. There's a whole teaching out there. There's a difference between managing and leading. Anybody can manage. It doesn't mean they're a leader. Leadership is influence. John Maxwell 101. Leadership is influence. So just because we might manage, manage something, my Lord. <laughs> just because, it's got to be the medicine I'm on. I must have took something and said hillbilly. <laughs> just because I manage something doesn't mean I'm a leader. Leadership is influence. When you are leading somebody, you show them how to do it. You walk with them how to do it. If they quit or whatever, then that's their issue. But, but you've got to have leadership or you've got to have vision. And when I say leadership, we should all be part of leadership. You should have leadership working in your life. Leadership over your money. Leadership over, 
God given us the right, has given us the right to govern our own lives. He gave man dominion. That is the right to govern. Why is it that we walk around like we have no clue what we're doing in our, in our, in our soul or in our emotions? Like we forgot how to govern our own mind. We act like walking around like we're half crazy. We have those moments. But did you forget that God's given you authority? You've got authority over this thing called your brain. Use it. Why do you think the Bible talks about putting a bridle over your tongue? Because your words are powerful. The things that you say go out in the atmosphere and they can cut people and they hurt people. And they can create. The Bible says the fruit of your lips will be created. Do we forget that, that we've got dominion? Sorry. I'm a little weird. I get mad at myself a lot. I get mad at myself when I let my soul rule me. And I'll be honest with you. I have an issue of trying to understand why every other Christian in the world do not get mad at themselves when they let their soul take them down a wrong road. Why doesn't that make you mad? Why doesn't that make you mad when something flies out of your mouth that shouldn't? Why doesn't that make you mad when a thought comes in and you don't grab a hold of it? Why doesn't that make you mad when you treat somebody like whatever because of the way that you're... Why doesn't that make you mad at the part that hasn't been redeemed yet on the inside of you? It ought to do something on the inside. You know what? This is not... Not mad as condemnation as being guilty. But you know what? Jesus came. Here's the, here's the truth. Jesus came that I might live my life in abundance at another level. So Jesus came and died for me. When I don't give that credence in my life, I'm slapping God right back in the face and saying, you know what, the cross didn't matter because what I feel matters more than what Jesus did. Now that's, I know I'm throwing that out there and I'm generalizing, but I'm just telling you, there's something on the inside of me and something on the inside of you as a Christian, as the ecclesia, who has been brought out of darkness into his light. There ought to be something that rises up on the inside of me and says, you know what? I ain't going to stay this way. I may have said it. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm in your mercy. I'm just going to quit using your humanness as a crutch. Well, I'm only human. Yeah, so am I. But it's Christ in me. It's Christ in me. I can't fix it. Don't take me wrong. I can't fix Kelly. I can't fix you. I'm trying to get that revelation. I can't fix anybody, but I'm telling you, it's Christ in me. It's Christ in you, and we're going to mess up. You're going to say wrong things. You're going to screw up, but that's when you pull on the grace of God. But I'm saying there's got to be something that rises up and says, you know what? God didn't make me to be this way. And so I'm going to shift it. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get in his presence. I'm going to work on getting my healing. I'm going to get where I need to be in the presence of God and let the Holy Ghost begin to move on the end. Stir up the well that lies on the inside of me. Bring it up in the name of Jesus. Pray for yourself and talk to yourself. And get yourself where you need to be by the grace of God. I wish I had some passion. Does that, that make sense to you? Look, this is not about condemnation. Y'all hear this is not about you being guilty. I'm saying I get I get mad at myself because I go places I shouldn't go. Did you hear see me do that? I go places I shouldn't go. And I just wonder why doesn't it make every other Christian mad? And maybe it does. Maybe I'm the one with the microphone. <laughs> Let's move on. Get off my spiritual soapbox. Everybody okay? <laughs> Shut up. I'm going to get well sooner or later. I'm raggy. All right, number three. Here we go. What causes self-imposed barriers for your life? You ready? You got it. <laughs> Jeremy, I know that wasn't you. <laughs> as soon as she did that, Jeremy's face... Come behind the soundboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we gotta go here. All right, number three. What causes self-imposed barriers in your life causes not you to have vision? When you don't believe standards and ethics belong to you. When you don't believe that standards and ethics belong to you. Now, let me walk around this a little bit. When you don't believe that standards and ethics belong to you, it causes a self-imposed barrier. Do you realize because of how we are raised, Hold on, I'm getting way ahead of myself. 
I'm a processor, and I process, I, I think out loud. And sometimes my mind moves faster than my mouth can catch up, and y'all are sitting there like, what is he doing? And I'm thinking, don't you understand what I'm saying? Didn't you just hear what all the little voices told me in my head? Just kidding. Just a couple of them. When we're children, because I've often wondered, why am I struggling with this thing when that happened to me when I was seven years old? I'm 46. Why am I struggling? Does that make sense to you? Because when you're a child, you have no filter. Our filter is supposed to be our teachers, our parents. That's supposed to be our filter to teach us. And so when things happen to us when we're children, that's why they're still fresh in you today. When dysfunction happens, that's why it's still fresh in you today because things happen to you and happened to all of us when we were kids where a memory stands out and it caused hurt. Okay? If, it, 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 you know, I, I, I've had great parents. They were great filters for me, but I was abused in, second, in my second grade school. I'm not going to talk about all that again, but she was supposed to be my filter. Well, she didn't have one. And so I had a good filter at home, but the six hours I was with her, I didn't have one. And so she stole my security. Does that make sense to you? So all the years of growing up in relationships and in my jobs and different things like that, Whitney, I struggled with being insecure. And I still struggle with it. I, I know you don't believe that, but um, I still struggle with insecurity. And I think, to be honest with you, everybody does. But she was supposed to be my filter. Are you with me? So that's why my parents are supposed to be my filter. And your parents and, and, and your, the adults that help protect you as a child, they're supposed to be your filter. But what if they're screwed up? What if their filter was screwed up when they were little? Do you see it's a one dysfunction after another? And so I think sometimes the way that we walk through things in our life, some people don't change because they don't really believe that standards and ethics can belong to them because they never had them when they were little. They were never taught that. Does it make sense? Because they don't believe that standards belong to them because they don't feel like they're good enough. In reality, I'm not good enough to have this standard in my life. I'm only loved when I step out of that lane. I'm only accepted when I do this. There's not a standard or an ethic there, but, but if I do this, then it's going to make me feel good and then I'll be accepted. It all stems from insecurity. So people don't believe that standards and ethics can be a part of their life. And so what that does is it causes a self-imposed barrier. God, I'm good tonight. But it causes a self-imposed barrier to when God wants to come in and impart vision and lead you somewhere. You're not going to see it or you're going to feel like you're not good enough or you can never live up to it. And so you step back and you stay in your struggle. But you got to understand that Jesus came and died and rose again, that standards and ethics could be a part of my life. Do I deserve any of it? No, I don't. But because of Jesus Christ, because God first so or because God so loved me, the world, and you, the world, that he gave his only begotten son. So when God looks at me, he doesn't see all my junk. He sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I am accepted. That is the gospel in a nutshell. So that tells me that standards and ethics can belong to me. Do I deserve them? No. I don't even deserve God's love, but that's what grace is all about. It is unmerited favor. I don't deserve it, but he loves me because he chooses to love me. So sometimes we have self-imposed barriers in our life because we be really believe that standards and ethics don't belong to me because I'm not good enough. Well, let me help you. You're not good enough, and neither am I. That's why the love of God is so awesome. Standards and ethics can belong to you because of what Jesus did at Calvary. And if you just let God love you, those things can belong to you. And those self-imposed barriers can come down little by little in your life. Does that make sense? Is that my medicine talking? Does that make sense to everybody? Psalms 41 12. I'm just going to read it to you. It says you have upheld me. This is David. You have upheld my integrity and set me in your presence. David said you have upheld me. You have upheld me in my integrity. God will uphold you. Come on. God will uphold you. He is your refuge. Let him fight for you. Trust in him. Amen. God, will, you have upheld me in my integrity and set me in your presence. 
Yeah? You have upheld me in my integrity and set me in your presence. Presence. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3 says, The integrity of the upright will guide them, but crookedness will destroy them. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but crookedness will destroy them. You may have a good gift on the inside of you, but if you ain't got no character, you ain't going to go anywhere. Your character can't keep you. Your character is who you are when nobody's looking. Let me say it again. Your character is who you are when nobody's looking. Now, again, that's not to condemn, but it's about responsibility. Amen. Yeah? You'll never rise above the level of your character. Amen. No, I'm not going to say that one. I'm not going to say that one either. Let's go on to number four. Everybody okay? Yeah? Number four. What causes self-imposed barriers in your life? When you lack generosity. When you lack generosity in your life. Everybody say generosity. Yeah? People of vision and good leaders always share their ideas and always share their resources. Yeah? When you have generosity, when you're a person of vision and when you are a leader, yeah? When you are a leader and you have vision in your life, okay, you serve. You serve. Who? People. You serve people. You can't get around people. This world is full of people. Hereby say people. You've got to serve. Jesse, I'm going to embarrass you if that's okay. My wife says, babe, you do that to people all the time. You say it, you ask them in front of people. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I talked about we had a need and uh, in our children's ministry and some other people volunteer, but Jesse volunteered because she's serving. Can I tell you, when you have a spirit of generosity in your life to help serve people and help bless people, it causes you to have vision for your life. It's just another plug-in. It's just another connection. Yeah. Uh, I, as you, most of you know, I've been sick a lot here last couple days. Um, what's today? Wednesday. And Tuesday wasn't feeling good. And I was talking to, to Bertie over the phone and, um, you know, and Bertie's like, pastor, I'm going to, uh, I just want to bring you some lunch. And uh, Bertie has awesome. It was like potatoes, little red potatoes and roast beef. And it was really good stuff. Um, she brought me all kinds of fruit and just, she just, she's serving. You know, I'm like, I kind of feel kind of weird, but it tasted good. You got any more? So saw you want. And <laughs> she said, and as she was leaving, she's like, you can share that with Pastor Tracy. I'm like, are you kidding? There ain't going to be nothing left. Give Pastor Tracy, she can go Taco Bell. I'm going to eat. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But she was serving. Why? Because she's generous. Jesse has a generous attitude, a generous heart, a generous spirit. When, 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 when you are not generous... It causes a self-imposed barrier. And the more self-imposed barriers you have in your life, the more vision you do not have. I don't know if I said that right, but it, it causes vision to be blurred when you have barriers. So there's things that you need to start working on. You need to be more generous. Generous. <laughs> Sphere. Shut up. You need to be more generous. Have a generous attitude. Be a person that's willing to serve, even if it costs you. And if it don't cost you something, then you're probably not really serving. I'm going to say it again. If it don't cost you something, you're probably not really serving. Because when you serve somebody else, it costs you something. It costs you your time. Sometimes it costs you your money. Sometimes it costs you your pride. Amen. But what you were doing is when you have those attitudes, I believe that, that God begins to help. It helps to remove the blinders over your eyes so you can have vision. And you keep doing it. Does that make sense to you? The two of you. So you keep doing it. So we talked about vision for your life and self-imposed barriers. Okay? So you've got to have some clear, defined, personal goals for your life. And that doesn't mean that you're not being spiritual. That doesn't mean that you're not being spiritual. Let me think of some examples. The first one example I use all the time. God put Adam in the garden and said, now reproduce and multiply. He didn't say go over there and pray for an hour. He said, I want you to take what the potential. Come on, if I say potential. I want you to take all the potential that I placed in you, and then I want you to reproduce it in the natural. 
After you reproduce it in the natural, then I want you to multiply it. Okay, so I used to be a pretty decent drummer. Dustin, don't say a word. I used to be a pretty decent drummer, okay? So that was producing in the natural the gift that God I never had a lesson in my life. Don't ever anybody say, oh, I could tell, okay? Okay, so I never had a lesson in my life. It was just a gift from God, okay? So it's my responsibility to make myself better as a musician. Does that make sense to you? So whatever you do in your job, whatever giftings and talents that you have in your job, it's your responsibility to multiply those because it's part of your potential. As a husband, as a wife, as a, as a son or as a daughter, as a friend, whatever giftings that you have on the inside, it's your responsibility to multiply those. Amen. And you make yourself better, reproduce and multiply. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. Stir, stir those gifts, and it's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but you know what? There's some natural gifts that God's given you. And, and just because you're making the natural part of you better doesn't mean you're not spiritual. It just means you're being responsible. Because you've got to understand, there, there's a couple types of Christians in this life, especially in America. Well, because I'm a Christian, God becomes my genie in a bottle. And I hear so many people, and they just don't get it. And I've been there myself, so again, I'm not trying to throw stones, but I don't understand why God would allow this. That's a lie. I don't understand why God's caused this in my life. So you don't know who else to blame, so you blame God for it. Like God caused it. When the Bible clearly says he's not mad at us, the Bible clearly says, I'm paraphrasing, but he's not disappointed in me. So why am I blaming God for something that maybe I could change if I made the right choices. What was that? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thought I was in trouble there for a moment. It doesn't mean it's God's fault, but because we've mad bad, mad, because we made bad choices. See, here's what happens. Y'all okay tonight? We're almost done. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Did you say, yeah, was that you who said it? Thanks. <laughs> was that you? Wow, Whitney. <laughs> yeah, that's good, Pastor. Thanks, Whitney. <laughs> um, <laughs> here's what happens, guys. This is not a crutch, but because we're human, and we have a fallen nature, we have a wrong thought. Do you know that you can't stop wrong thinking from entering into your mind, but you can stop what you do with it? You can't always help the way that you feel, but you can help what you do with what you feel. It's about governing our lives. But here's what happens. The Bible says, and I don't have the scripture verse for it, but it says basically uh, to cast down anything that exalts itself against the knowledge or revelation or vision of God. Casting down imaginations. That's it. Okay, I said it, but my mama just said it a lot better than I did. So that imagination comes in your mind. Sometimes that could be wrong vision. It could be wrong thinking. Because the Bible says as we think is as we are. Yeah. So if I don't capture that wrong thought then it will become a stronghold. Stronghold is a 40 fortified place. It's, okay. Thanks, buddy. It's your last service Wednesday night for like three months. He's telling me. Um, <laughs> it's true. In five minutes, you guys can go up. Um, so it, that becomes a stronghold in my mind because I haven't grabbed a hold of that thought and replaced it with the truth. And if I don't grab a hold of that thought, see, you've got to retrain your brain. You've got to understand that when a wrong thought comes in your mind, if you don't take a hold of that thing immediately, it will rule you. Fear, anger, depression, all those things, it's a trigger, whatever, okay? Addiction, bad habits. If you don't take a hold of that thing in your mind at that moment when you are supposed to, it will rule you. And I think one of the reasons why we don't, can I just be honest with you? Yeah, I'm going to anyway. Is because we're more comfortable with the dysfunction. 
We've laid in bed with fear and insecurity so much, we're more comfortable there than we are freedom. Freedom will cost you. Freedom, if freedom doesn't have a cost, it's probably not true freedom. But we're so used to this here. I was raised this way, or our perception is off. I don't want to ever. And, and, I, and, I, it's, and I'm not good at it, so please don't think that I think that I'm good at it. In fact, I, I'm not very good at it at all. But I know, I, guys, I believe that I know the truth. And that's what I base my whole life on. So I'm, I'm prefacing. So what, about, what I'm about to say, it's not that I'm good at it, but it's still the truth. How I many know the truth can be truth whether you're good at it or not? And now I've lost my thought. <laughs> I'll tell you next week. No, I'm just kidding. If my perception of how I see things keeps me from growing, I want it to make me sick to my stomach. If I become unteachable because I see things a certain way, and make, I'm making myself mad right now. I don't like what Kelly has. I like what Jesus has better. Because what Kelly has has always led me to the wrong spot. It's always hitting up against something. But what Jesus has for my life always leads me higher. The Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. Yeah? But it doesn't mean that they're not attainable. In fact, the Bible tells me that I have the mind of Christ. Not that I can get it. Maybe one day you'll have. No, it says I have. You have the mind of Christ. Number one, it's right here. In whatever version you like, it's here. Okay? But I've got it. And the more I get this here and here, the more the things of Kelly can go this way. But if your perception stops you from changing, you need to get some spiritual LASIK. Are you teachable? Who are you accountable to? Are you in a place of obedience? And again, this is not condemnation. This is things that help your life get better. And it's not about perfection. No. You know what? All the stuff that we've all been through stuff and we all go through stuff. <coughs> Being a pastor is my destiny. Running this ministry is my destiny. This church, the people of this church are my destiny. But when God... I, you know, it's like when God first, I knew I had the call for years. I specifically remember being 11 years old and knew it. Um, and at that time, uh, I set out mom and dad on a, about 3 a.m. in the morning and uh, on our picnic table in the back. I think it was like 1996. I was kidding. Um, late late 50s, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and I just remember looking up at the stars and talking to God. About 11 years old, Donna. And I said, I said, God, that's a little corny, but um, I said, God, you're my king. And I want to be your knight. That was my heart. You're my king. And I want to be your knight. I want to fight for you. I want to be everything you've called me to be at 11 years old. I'm not patting myself on the back, but that was my heart. And I remember my parents took me on some great vacations growing up. We were at Myrtle Beach, and I might have been, I don't know, maybe 13. Uh, and my parents got this big old Phineas Dake Bible, King James. I still have it, and they wrote in it. And, and I remember uh, we camped out on the beach, and I just felt God woke me up, and I went. How many know that the ocean's really freaky at night when you can't see anything? Did you ever get in there at night? It's like, like you don't know what's swimming around your feet. Dun -dun. Dun -dun. And you can't say anything, but the wind was blowing and the waves were coming in. It was 2 or 3 in the morning. And Brent, I had that big Bible in my hand. And I felt the wave of the wind just coming at me, Birdie. Just felt it coming at me. And God said, step into the water. And at first I was like, oh, really? <laughs> I think I should let him go. 
And I, I and I'm, so I stepped into the water. And he's like, go deeper. I had, I'm 13 years old. And so the wind was blowing and the waves. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. With, spoke to me and he said, uh, he said, the wind and the waves of life will come against you. But if you keep me number one in your life, the things that are knocking you back, you will you will defeat and you will walk over. And it's those things in my life, guys, that help keep me in the game. OK, I'm 28 years old now. I'm going to be 47 years old and, in, in, you know, whenever. Um, in, yeah, OK, thanks. Mama. Um, OK, and those things still give me vision. Because God cared enough about me to get my attention at a young age. So I always knew I had the call on my life. But then there was a time where I didn't want it. And the reason why I didn't want it was because of the hurt that I experienced. Because of being a pastor's son, watching what my parents walked through as headship, as pastors. Why would I want that? Just give me a nice career somewhere. Why would I want to deal with church people? That's the truth. Because church people are just like, they're just people. It's like anybody else, but there's, they gossip, they backbite, they get offended. They try to sue you for not shaking your hand. I mean, they just do silly things. So why would I want that? So when God called us back to Kentucky, the first thing I said was no. And then when I said, okay, but if, if my wife says yes, then okay, then it'll be you. So I went and told her and she's like, no. After a couple of years, we understood that this is what God had called us to. And so we're here. So it, 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 the vision of it keeps you in the game. The vision when God calls you keeps you in the game. And sometimes you got to remember, gosh, Rick, even when we were kids and how we were raised, when God showed up mightily, sometimes when you feel like God's not showing up mightily in your life now, you got to have a memorial on the inside of your mind where God did show up. My parents are pioneers. Rick, your parents are pioneers. Rick just lost his dad a couple weeks ago. Brother Gully, great pioneer. Rick, they paid a price so we could have what we have. You think I'm just going to throw that away because I feel a certain way? No, I'm going to keep vision. And I'm going to fight for the vision that God has given me. And I'm going to build my family. I'm going to build my life. I'm going to build in my relationships. I'm going to build what God has called me to be. Vision will keep you in your lane. And vision, godly vision, gives you direction. Well, how do I know if it's God's vision? Because if you look at your life and it seems impossible, then it's probably God. If you think you can do it, then it's probably you. God always calls you to a higher level. The higher authority... Okay, the higher level always has greater authority over the lower level. I can't do this church. Are you kidding me? Does that make you feel at ease as your pastor? No, it's only Christ in me that gives me the stamina. Say that right? The stamina, the endurance to stand when nothing else is going right. It's Christ in me. It's vision of who God is calling me to be. See yourself better. See yourself free. See yourself thinking differently. See your relationships better. And then begin to work backwards so you can go towards that thing. I see my life this way. I'm not there yet, but I'm building. Every step of faith I'm building by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I am building my life and vision is keeping me in my lane when storms come. Come on. I ain't who I used to be. My past is not my future. Come on, my past is not my future. But I'm not yet who God has finished. The finished work has not happened in me. I'm in the process. So what keeps me in the process, Cindy, is when I allow vision to be a part of my life. Where there is no vision, people die. Why do you stop dreaming? Why? Why do you let things steal the dream from you? Why do you let life steal the dream from you? You gotta stand up in your most holy faith, is what Paul told Timothy. You gotta stand up and you gotta let the Holy Ghost begin to move on the inside of you. Talk to yourself. Tell yourself to get in line. Make yourself worship. Make yourself pray. A relationship is not one way, it's both ways. Amen. And keep doing it. And let God bless you. Let God move on the inside of you. Have some hope that you never had. Have more faith than you ever had. What can you do to make yourself better through the grace of God? You got to have some personal goals. You got to have some personal goals. Come on, say goals. You got to begin to understand your strengths 
And then you've got to begin to understand your weaknesses. I'm going to say it again. Your strengths will tell you what your potential is. When I was a senior in high school, we had a, a class called communications. <laughs> Pretty ironic. I'm not very good at communicating. But I knew I was supposed to take that class. And I stood up in front of, uh, you know, 12 teenagers or whatever. And I had to give speeches. And I hated it. Because back then, I just wanted to stay behind, hide behind a drum kit. But I believe God had me take that class because that was going to be one of my strengths. And so it wasn't so too long that I got pretty good at it, despite what you think right now. Because that's my strength. So I begin to build on my strength. Your strength will tell you what your potential is. Now, you're going to have weaknesses. We all have weaknesses. I've got weaknesses and I've got strengths, but I understand what those things are so it can bring balance to my life and keep vision alive on the inside of me. So you've got to understand your strengths and weaknesses. And you've got to believe that you can have standards and that you can have ethics a part of who you are. God has given them to you. You have the right to have that. Amen. And you've got to have generosity moving and living in your life. You've got to have the love of Jesus. Amen. Vision. Vision moves you. Now you'll get sidetracked. You'll get sidetracked because life will just do it. The enemy will just sidetrack you. Life just happens. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And you've been through the mill. Okay? You've been through hell and high water. But that doesn't mean you quit. Don't let anything steal it from you. Don't let anything take your hope. Don't let anything take your faith. Mm -mm, you don't let anything steal it. You can. It's Christ in you. Amen? Does that help you tonight? Grab a hold of this thing, man. I preach this stuff and I don't always live it perfectly. That's why I need God's grace. But it's these things that keep me where I'm supposed to be. If I'm not where I'm supposed to be, I'm going to die. Amen. You can do this. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, you can do it. <laughs>